GLC is now offering a free audio stream of our 24-7 broadcast that we're calling GLC Radio, an online radio station that broadcasts our round-the-clock audio stream on a variety of platforms. GLC Radio gives you the ability to listen to GLC virtually anywhere, through your home or office computer, or on the go with a mobile device. You can access GLC Radio through our website or by searching for God's Learning Channel through iTunes Internet Radio, TuneInRadio.com, or on Shoutcast.com. Explore various GLC Radio-enabled mobile apps by visiting our website at glc.us.com forward slash listen forward slash GLC Radio. GLC Radio, your free connection to GLC anywhere, anytime. Praise God, and welcome to Monday's Update. Thank you. That's right. <clears throat> what do we got, ladies? Got lots of stuff. Lots of news today. Lots of news today. I put in some good news today. We've had so much bad news. <laughs> well, we were all excited about that one of the Marines. Yeah. But that's... Kicking butt and taking names on the train in France, but mm -hmm. it has been all over the news. Yes, it has. Everybody's very impressed with and that. We do join America in saluting those three fellas. Yeah, we do, because you know what? We really appreciate the veterans who serve our country. We do. You're all near and dear to our hearts. We wouldn't be here without you. We know and that. None of them ever had training on hand to hand. Isn't that something? It is. They got in there anyhow. So I guess we're going to kick off with a letter. Do you have a letter? I got one. It goes, dear Tommy, Al, and Amy. I have found you all on my Glory Star satellite about two or three years ago. I love Dr. Scott. He is so informative. I love you all too, and I learned a lot about the heavenly world we are headed for. I love watching you three and your guests. Sometimes it's Amy and two guests, and sometimes Al and Tommy and guests, but I enjoy your TV shows. I am 85. <laughs> on October 1st, and got the baptism in the Holy Spirit in 1997. 77. 77. And my world became His world, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. <laughs> I've read the New Testament six times, just finished the Old Testament. We'll start Genesis tomorrow. I am a practicing Catholic, but I am guided by the Holy Spirit. <clears throat> you all are true blue. I live alone, and my husband died after my husband died, Mother's Day in June 2006. For two years, we prayed together. He would remind me if I skipped someone in my intercessory prayer list. So when he died, I have a list now. I'm on the prayer chain in my church. I lost my son to cancer April the 2nd. 2015. He was 55 years old, my baby boy. I had five boys and my girl, Lori. I pray early every morning for all of you and the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. Love, Gloria from Cynthia Anna. I think I said that right. Cynthia Anna. Mm -hmm. Indiana. Wow. Thank you. What a letter. It's a wonderful letter. Thank you for writing, Gloria. Yes. You know what? <clears throat> I'd be praying for you. It would be very, very hard mm -hmm. to have a son, to have a child, and to lose them. I wasn't able to have kids, so I've always said that the only thing that could possibly w be worse than not being able to have children is to have them and lose them. Mm -hmm. So, <clears throat> Yep, I think so. so. Okay. You're going on our <clears throat> prayer list. What can we say? <laughs> And thank you for praying for us. Mm -hmm. Amen. Absolutely. We need it. You're like our, our, the veterans. We wouldn't be here without you. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> well, that's a true statement. Mm -hmm. Oh, golly. So what is this devotion, Mama? Well, it's about the palm tree because we've got a special article about a palm tree today. The date it, palm. In fact, it's, it's mentioned in this devotion. But... Um, Psalm 92, 12 and 13 says, The righteous shall flourish like a palm tree. He shall grow like a cedar in Lebanon. Those who are planted in the house of the Lord shall flourish in the courts of our God. They shall still bear fruit in old age. There is some remarkable news in Israel about a palm tree. 
that has done exactly that. In the 1960s, archaeologists found an ancient jar containing palm seeds that were 2,000 years old. They sat in someone's drawer for decades until in 2005 they were planted, and lo and behold, they sprouted. Astonishingly, a palm tree has successfully grown from these seeds from biblical times. What's even more amazing is that this tree, the male palm tree, and they call, him, call it Methuselah, is now 10 years old and has successfully pollinated a female palm tree, which has produced dates. This miraculous palm tree really has borne fruit in its old age. I'm sharing this with mom, but one of the most stunning things is the date palm groves in Israel. Yeah, and you see them gorgeous. down, especially by the, the Dead Sea. And they're, they're stunning. They're so high. Mm -hmm. There are countless palm trees in every direction in Israel. And there is a wonderful biblical significance to the tree, which we can remember every time we see them or taste its fruit, which is yummy. There were seven species of food that God assured his people that they would find in the promised land, listed in order that they are ready to harvest. They are barley, wheat, grapes, honey, figs, pomegranates, and olives. Deuteronomy 8.8. 8. The honey listed here is the date syrup that comes from palm trees, making palms one of the seven species of promise. It's interesting, too, that date palm trees are either f male or female and cannot produce fruit without the other. The temple is decorated with multiple pairs of trees, male and female, on either side of the doorways, as if welcoming those who enter. They're also thought to be reminiscent of the Garden of Eden, which the temple was supposed to represent, a way back to paradise and right relationship with God. There are 32 mentions of the palm tree in the Bible, depending on how you count it, which fall into these categories. The leaves were used to celebrate at the Feast of Tabernacles, that would be Sukkot, mentioned in Leviticus and Nehemiah. Palms were used as decoration in Solomon's temple. Ezekiel's description of the third temple includes multiple pairs of palm trees flanking doorways. The city of Jericho is often referred to as the city of palms a number of times. A couple of times it's referred to in contrast to the reed, the strong in contrast to the weak. The woman in Song of Songs, the Song of Solomon, is twice likened to a palm tree. It's used to describe the righteous in Psalm 92. The leaves are waved in victory and praise as Jesus enters Jerusalem and then also in the book of Revelation. Broadly, palm trees represent victory, uprightness, and no, uprightness and righteousness. Early church father Origen calls the palm the symbol of victory in that war waged by the spirit against the flesh and representations of palm trees featured strongly in early Christian art to symbolize spiritual triumph and heaven. The palm also plays a part in the Feast of Tabernacles, or Sukkot, as it's called in Hebrews. It is one of the four types of plant that God ordained for the celebration, myrtle, palm, and willow branches, and the citrus fruit. Some say that the palm is like the strength of the backbone in this arrangement, and others say that the sweet fruit the palm gives represents those who know and love God's law. But God doesn't specify in the Bible why he selected these particular species. If the palm trees are used as a welcoming decoration to the door frames of the temple and were used to welcome Yeshua's entry into Jerusalem at his first coming, perhaps the palms in the Feast of Tabernacles is also a sign of welcome for the coming king when he comes again to tabernacle amongst us when he returns. The return of the Messiah will certainly be a great time of victory. 19th century Bible commentator Albert Barnes reflects <laughs> on the subject. The palm rising above the world. He notes, well is the life of the righteous likened to a palm in that the palm below is rough to the touch 
and in a manner developed, enveloped in dry bark. But above it, it's adorned with fruit, fair even to the eye. Below, it is compressed by the enfoldings of its bark. Above, it's spread out in amplitude of beautiful greenness. For so is the life of the elect, despised below, beautiful above. Down below, it is, as it were, enfolded in many barks, and that it is straightened by innumerable afflictions. But on high, it's expanded into a foliage, as it were, of beautiful greenness by the amplitude of the rewarding. As someone else put it, this verse is a picture of the believer who in the midst of drought, death, dearth, and desolation fixes their faith and trust down deep in the living promises of God and flourishes for him in company with other believers. Palm trees, as anyone who watches the news will know, can flex and withstand the battering of some serious storms. Their roots go deep and their trunks can bend so that they stay strong in drought, wind and storm. They can flourish even in harsh conditions. And that's what can also be said of those who drink deep from God's living waters. The palm tree being one of the promised seven species of the land is deeply significant to Israel, a sign of fruitfulness and abundance. So much so, in fact, that it appears on the back of the ten shekel coin, with baskets full of dates on either side. Around the edge of the coin is written, For the Redemption of Zion. Please pray for Israel to come to know the redemption that was purchased for them and our precious Messiah, Yeshua, and according to Psalm 92, 12 through 15, to be planted and flourish in his courts like majestic palm trees displaying his victory. The righteous shall flourish like a palm tree. He shall grow like a cedar in Lebanon. Those who are planted in the house of the Lord shall flourish in the courts of our God. They shall still bear fruit in old age. They shall be fresh and flourishing. To declare that the Lord is upright. He is my rock and there is no unrighteousness in him. Amen. That's and, good. And then we're going to now tell you about Methuselah. <laughs> Methuselah, the, 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 the date, date. palm. Uh -huh. uh, this comes from National Geographic. <clears throat> Ten years after sprouting from an ancient seed, the date palm is a big boy now, a scientist says, and yeah, he can make dates. A male date palm tree named Methuselah that sprouted from a 2,000-year-old seed nearly a decade ago is thriving today according to the Israeli researcher who is cultivating the historic plant. The plant was sprouted in a laboratory in 2005. And when a National Geographic news story about the event resurfaced this week on a social media website, Read It, we decided to check in on Methuselah and see how it's doing. Well, he's a big boy now, says Elaine Salary, the director of the Arava Institute for Environmental Studies at Kibbutz Keturah in Israel. He's over three meters, that's 10 feet tall. He's got a few offshoots, he has flowers, and his pollen is good, she says. We pollinated a female with his pollen, a wild modern female, and yeah, he can make dates. In 2005, Soloway, an expert in desert agriculture, germinated the ancient seed which was recovered decades earlier from an archaeological excavation at Masada, a historic mountainside fortress. The seed had spent years in a researcher's drawer in Tel Aviv. In the years since Methuselah first sprouted, Soloway had successfully germinated a handful of other date palms from ancient seeds recovered at archaeological sites around the Dead Sea. I'm trying to figure out how to plant an ancient date grove, she says. <laughs> to do that, she'll need to grow a female plant from an ancient seed as a mate for Methuselah. So far, at least two of the other ancient seeds that have sprouted are female. If Soloway succeeds, she notes, we would know what kind of dates they ate in those days and what they were like. That would be very exciting. Genetic tests indicate that Methuselah is most closely related to an ancient variety of date palms from Egypt known as uh, Hayani, which fits with a legend that says dates came to Israel with the children of the Exodus, Soloway says. 
it's pretty clear that Methuselah is a Western date from North Africa rather than from Iraq, Iran or Babylon, she says. You cannot confirm a legend, of course. In addition to Soloway's hopes of establishing an orchard of ancient dates, she and colleagues are interested in studying the plants to see if they have any unique medicinal properties. The other date palms sprouted from ancient seeds look similar to Methuselah. Distinguishing characteristics, Soloway says, include a sharp angle between the fronds and spine. A lot of people have kind of forgotten about Methuselah, Soloway says. He's actually a really pretty tree. In 2012, scientists in Russia were able to grow a plant from a 32,000-year-old seed that had been buried by an Ice Age squirrel in Siberia. <laughs> well, okay, we'll take that one with a grain of salt. <laughs> okay, so I can tell you <clears throat> that the dates in Israel that come from Israel are so incredibly delicious. They are. You can actually go on eBay and buy them. Mm -hmm. And you know why I know this? Because I've done it. And <laughs> when Steve Shermet was, was here, I guess all the guys were here for Shepherd's Heart about six, seven months ago, I had just gotten some. It was the first time I'd ordered some. And Steve was ecstatic because that is his favorite. <laughs> so, hmm. you know, uh, <clears throat> I know we were on a tour in Israel in 2005 when they announced that they had uh, were taking great pains to uh, get this seed to grow. It wasn't just a matter of putting it in dirt and watering it. You know, it was. Mm -hmm. Well, what I think interest is interesting about that is that they found him in an archaeological dig at Masada. At Masada. And what I had just told you was that the beautiful date palm groves are at the Dead Sea. Well, that's where mm -hmm. Masada is. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, how cool is that? Yeah, really. Okay, well, now we'll get to some other not-so-fun <laughs> news, I guess. This comes from UCI. Uh, Minister of Internal Security in Israel, Gilad Erdan, sent Def Defense Minister Moshe Ya'alon a letter on Monday asking him to urgently declare the Arab organizations that create mayhem on the Temple Mount as illegal. If the defense minister signs a declaration to this effect, security forces will have a freer hand against the rioters. Erdan has been carrying out behind the scenes staff work in the past few weeks together with police, the Israel Security Agency, ISA, or Sheen Bet, the state attorney's office, and even the attorney general who has agreed to help advance the declaration. In the discussion of the problem, Erdan was shown, has was shown evidence that the so-called uh, Morbiatun and Morbiatat, as the male and female groups of Muslim mayhem makers are named, are directed by the Northern Army of the Islamic Movement in Israel. The purpose of their activity is to destabilize the status quo on the Temple Mount, and they have succeeded in creating escalation on the Mount and in making the security situation there untenable. Events on the Temple Mount have led youths to commit acts of terror in the past and could do so again in the future, said sources close to Erdan. They added that the Morabatun and Morabatat's activities on the Temple Mount have caused much friction and violence between the organization's members and Jews visiting the Mount. Erdan's letter to Ailan was accompanied by professional opinions from the Israel police and the ISA. Erdogan's bureau said Monday that the aggress aggressive and threatening behavior of the Arabs on the Temple Mount, the Temple Mount, affects the compound's routine very negatively, endangers the public, and makes it difficult to maintain peace. In recent weeks, there has been an escalation in Muslim violence against Jews at, on the Mount. Last week, in Ola Hadasha, a new Jewish immigrant to Israel was physically assaulted by the Morabatat. But Jews who ascended to the Temple Mount Monday heard an unfamiliar sound, the sound of quiet. The Jews reported that for an unknown reason, the Morabatat, the Muslim women, who were always on hand to assault Jews visiting the Mount, screaming and cursing and throwing objects at them, were not present. 
Did we share that article last week? I know that we pulled it. Of, of uh, the attacks on the Well, temple, no, of that specific Of woman. that very specific lady who was an elderly I, lady I who had just made Aliyah. Mm -hmm. And uh, she was actually, I believe, punched mm -hmm. by was. one of those Muslim mm -hmm. women. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it was getting out of hand. <clears throat> I'm glad they're doing something about it. Uh, yeah, it's about time. This is a good news article. Slovakia agreed last week to accept Syrian Christian refugees, but only if they are devout churchgoers, the Syrian Observatory for, at, for Human Rights reported. As hundreds of thousands of refugees fleeing conflict in Syria, Iraq, and Afghanistan, and poverty in Africa risk their lives to reach the safety of Europe, some Eastern European states are embarking on a contentious strategy of selecting only Christian refugees for resettlement. That's interesting. It is. We block the Christian refugees oh, here. Yeah. Poland out. agreed to accept 50 Christian families from Syria under an initiative led by a private organization and agreed to by the Prime Minister. Slovakia has said it will take 200 refugees from the war-torn country, but only if they are devout churchgoers. The Czech Republic applied the same criteria to 70 families granted asylum this year. The, they, the non-Christian refugees, can be a threat to Poland. I think it's a great way for ISIS to locate their troops all around Europe, said Mariam Shaded, head of Esteria, the Polish foundation that arranged the selection and immigration of Mr. Saad and 49 other families into Poland. And if these people are not ISIS representatives in Syria, their lives are not in danger. So then it's a labor migration. If they're Muslim, they'll not be killed because they are Muslims, because they believe in the same as ISIS. The war in Syria, which began in 2011, has killed hundreds of thousands of people and displaced millions more, contributing to a surge in refugees that saw 110,000 enter Europe in July alone the highest ever monthly total. Wow. Wow. Yeah, it's really bad. You don't have to read too far on the, the news to see how bad it is. Okay, this next article comes from Matt Staver, and just FYI, we're pulling from the vault tonight, and it is uh, a program that Matt Staver did in July of okay. 2012. It's obviously not going to be about ISIS. ISIS terrorists may well be selling the organs of enslaved Zidi women to fund their murderous caliphate in the Middle East. A just released report by the Middle East Media Research Institute, which monitors the is Islamic State supporters online, states, these social media conversations also reveal information on where and under what conditions the, woman or the women are being held, on the going prices for them, and even on other issues relating to them such as possible trafficking in human organs. No longer content to stone, behead, and burn Christians and other religious minorities, those Islamic State barbarians are now adding the sale of harvested organs as another of their twisted crimes against humanity. Perhaps even more unbelievable is that ISIS members believe that the rape, torture, and murder of Christians is a form of worship that draws them closer to their God. These sickening reports coming from the Middle East certainly gave me pause, but at the same time, Matt says he's so grateful that God has called us into this region to serve as a lifeline to brothers, Christian brothers and sisters who are being targeted by these maniacs. And as you may know, Liberty Relief International, through our partner organizations in the Middle East, has been at the forefront, pushing back against ISIS slaughter and of innocent Christians and other religious minorities. Teams of volunteers risk their own safety, actively searching for and bringing victims into our safe camps. Here, refugees have their basic needs met by compassionate, Christ-centered workers who also strive to provide a strong level of safety, peace, and comfort. Whether in an abandoned church, school, or a collection of tents, thousands of men, women, and children can drop their burdens in fear of being raped, tortured, and even murdered because of their faith. 
In fact, as one camp worker explained, here they are bathed in the love of Jesus Christ. With each passing day, the immense need for emergency relief for victims of ISIS religious cleansing is growing at an alarming pace. <coughs> my, my. Yes, and this is an interesting article about um, Abu Mazen. <laughs> he says he will visit Iran. And after the nuclear agreement, the world is getting closer to Iran, and so is the Palestinian Authority. Palestinian Authority Chairman Abu Mazen announced officially today his intention to visit Tehran. In a conversation with journalists, he stressed that an exact time for a visit has not been decided upon, but his goal is to strengthen relations between the Islamic Republic and the Palestinian Authority. That's not real surprising. No. During the meeting, Abu Mazen praised Iran, claiming that it is a neighboring country that is united with the Palestinian people. According to him, PA-Iranian relations are strong, and even though the PA has an embassy in Tehran, they seek to strengthen the relationship even more. A number of days before, a senior-level lev Iranian official denied reports according to which uh, Abu Mazen is expected to visit the country. Local media outlets noted that the senior level Iranian official stated this in order to prevent the visit. To the contrary, the Palestinian Authority seeks to portray itself as an open movement that rivals the Hamas terror organization, which is already supported by Iran. Sad. Iran is not really a friend of the Palestinian people. It, if we have time to do this next article. Of oh, we do. We've got two and a half minutes. I bet we can kick it out. All right, let's do it. We can try real fast. Um, this comes from the Gatestone Institute. According to the researcher, many Palestinians captured by Shiite militias in Iraq have been brutally tortured and forced to confess to their alleged involvement in terrorism. Since 2003, the number of Palestinians there has dropped from 25,000 to 6,000. Most interesting is the complete indifference displayed by the international human rights organizations, the media, and the Palestinian Authority toward the mistreatment of Palestinians in Arab countries. International journalists do not care about the Palestinians in the Arab world because this is not a story that can be blamed on Israel. The UN and other international bodies have obviously not heard of the ethnic cleansing of Palestinians in the Arab world. They're so obsessed with Israel that they prefer not to hear about the suffering of Palestinians under Arab regimes. PA leaders say they want to press war crime charges against Israel with the International Criminal Court. However, when it comes to ethnic cleansing and torture of Palestinians in Arab countries, such as Iraq, Syria, and Lebanon, they kind of choose to look the other way. An Arab killing or torturing an Arab is not an item worthy publishing in a major newspaper in the West. But when a Palestinian complains against the Israeli authorities or Jewish settlers, many Western journalists rush to cover this major development. Not only do the Arab countries despise the Palestinians, they also want them to be the problem of Israel alone. Since 1948, Arab governments have refused to allow Palestinians permanently to settle in their countries and become equal citizens. Now these Arab countries are also killing and torturing them and subjecting them to ethnic cleansing, all while world leaders continue to bury their heads in the sand and point an accusing finger at Israel. Aha, uh -huh. so it's not really about the Palestinians. It's really not. But, you know, that just sheds a whole different light on the way we need to be praying. Well, you know, thanks to media control, you really can't tell who your enemies are anyway. That's true. So that's why maybe God tells us to pray for our enemies as well <laughs> as our mom and dad. Right? We love you, and we will see you on Wednesday. <laughs>